you, Billy, for this opportunity to meet with you as the founder of Sesame and to hear a bit about the Sesame story, how it started and where we're going now. A lot of people today have never heard about drama therapy, let alone the Sesame approach. How would you explain drama movement therapy to someone who's never heard about it before? I think it's very difficult to do that unless the people asking the question know something, at least about acting or theatre, which is miles away from Sesame, but at least it gives a sort of common subject to start on. Uh, apart from that, um, it was much easier when we started Sesame because we had cats, who I think will come into the picture later on. So they more or less showed what Sesame was about. Uh, because the people they were in contact with all had difficulties. And if you see people who don't do things doing them, then you begin to believe in the medium. Will you tell us the dream again, Billy? I have to give a little bit of background to the dream. Um, I was on the executive committee of an organisation called Radius that used to take plays into all sorts of churches. It was a religious organisation. How I got into it is another story, but anyhow, there I was. And um, the, it started many years ago with a Zen Buddhist and a Christian, and wonderful plays were performed. And then it got worse and worse, and the plays were awful, I thought, anyway. And there was danger of uh, this organisation closing down. So I thought, well, that seems pity after so many years. And I, this is important because that's why I had the dream. I went to sleep, and the dream was that I was in uh, what was called a long-stay ward of a psychiatric hospital and everybody was separated from everybody else as they always are inclined to be. There was no communication at all and there was utter loneliness and, and it was awful. And um, some people that I was training with and working with came into the hospital and started moving with the people who were so ill and kind of inviting them to come in and be together. And they did. They were together. They came in. And the whole of this isolated group of people became one group. And then I said to myself in the dream, well, that's what radius ought to be doing. They ought to be taking plays into all these homes in special places, but sticking around taking them into churches. And then there could be more, said the dream, because what we've just done now in this hospital, in the dream, of course, could be spread out everywhere. That was my modest little conclusion. <laughs> That's more or less the dream, I think. What gave you the idea to call your brand of therapy Sesame? It didn't. It wasn't my idea. It was um, somebody called Stella Newton. It was her idea. She was uh, a very interesting person. She was actually the greatest authority on historical dress. But she was a wonderful person, apart altogether from that. And she supported Sesame after she died, because she left us a lot of money, and during her lifetime. That, of course, was from the, uh, the tale of Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, the open Sesame. Open the door to the magic. Mm. So talking about magic, Billy, what do you believe to be the magic of Sesame? And why is it effective as therapy? I think the magic for me 
came when I was part of the CATS group because every center we went into something absolutely magical happened and one story which I think I wrote about as well was we, we, we were doing action plots, little, little plots and acting them and then inviting people to take part with us and in this particular case it may be hard to believe but I was a bride and um, one of the other members, uh, a man was, was, uh, was uh, we were two dolls who had been looking at each other. He'd been looking at me for years and years and years, we were rotting away on our stand. And we were going to have a wedding and get married. And so uh, everything was given to me. So I had a looking glass to look into to see if I was all right. And uh, a veil was put on and it was a very conventional wedding and a lovely bunch of flowers was given to me. And then the idea was that I should go around and share the flowers with all the people who were sitting watching. And I gave a flower to one young man who in those days would have been said to have Down syndrome, I'm not sure, about terminology today. He picked up the flap of his shirt or coat, put the flower in, pulled it through, smelt it and said, nice smell. And his mother came to me afterwards and said, you have created a miracle. I have never heard my son speak. I didn't know he could and I didn't know he had any understanding. Well, magic? I don't know. But that was what I would call magic. And it happened over and over and over again with cats in different ways. When you first started using your brand of therapy, um, you must have met some resistance. What kind of resistance did you meet and how did you help people to overcome these resistances? We sent the cats in. They went to hospitals and homes all over the country. We had no problem when the cats had been. So tell us something about the cats, who they were and how you went around and well, the cats were formed from the people who'd been training for so long with Ursula Nicholl, who was our director. And the moment Sesame started, I suppose I said, um, well, how are we going to show people what this is about? And somebody or all of us said, well, why don't we form a mime and movement group? We don't have to speak and confuse people with words. And we work together, we love each other. Let's do it. So seven of us did it. And um, we travelled all over the country, we went up to Scotland and all over Wales and different parts of England. And um, it's not a boast, but it's a fact to say we never had a failure. We always amazed people. So it was, it was the most wonderful experience to be a cat, really. I believe you've written a book about your work in Africa. Could you tell us a bit more about that work and how, how that work influenced the Sesame approach? This was the most wonderful experience of my whole life. When I got to the country, I thought, I never want to leave this country. This is so special. You know, you get a wild animal crossing the road in front of you and, and, and the shape of the trees, which are long and like that, only in Africa. You don't see them anywhere else like that. And the climate and, and everything about it, it, it sort of drew me to it. And I loved the people, and they were having a very bad time at that time. The apartheid regime was going on, which, needless to say, I was... Um, dead against, to put it mildly, and so I was working to start off with in a group of hospitals. And what I did was what I would do here. Um, we had a lot of staff um, and different groups of patients, some of whom I worked in children's wards and I worked in the adult wards and the children of course had different disabilities and it was wonderful. 
that's where I learned about stamping because I Peter Slade always used to do a bit of stamping. But in Africa, because it's part in the tradition of the people I was with, and I think in quite a few uh, African traditions, because everyone's a bit different, they would go down very hard on their heel and then go on their toe. It's a really, and of course the arms would go back. This is a bull's horns, the arms going up. The men were the bulls, not the women. Of course, they don't do that, but the women do other things. And they'd go round and round stamping. And the circle was all right for me. Anti-clockwise is right for the ancestors who come into the home life, the shades of the ancestors. They, they go that way round. And then we did stories about the ways of the people, because I refused to work there till I had learnt, certainly, about some of the very deep beliefs which, which carry through, even if they're denied, and they were being denied to the people by the white people. So, I mean, this is not everyday work, is it? This is amazing. I went back and back several times. Could you tell us about going to see the healer and the white beads? I had read a very good book about the Zulu people, so I knew more about them than any of the other people, because they are a little bit different. There are different, there are eight different uh, groups of people in South Africa. And um, I had a cousin who grew up with the Zulu people, so she spoke perfect Zulu and everywhere she lived, she adored the people. And she said she could arrange for me to meet uh, a traditional healer. And I never want to hear anybody talking about witch doctors in my life. They are traditional healers. And <laughs> I went to see one. And um, I wanted to know what was referred to as the special steps of a healing dance which you get called to be a healer, like in a Christian sense you might be called to be a priest, or I don't know about other religions enough to be able to say what they do, but these people are called. And um, their families, uh, they're very ill, they behave in a very peculiar fashion, and their families uh, gather around when the, a traditional healer comes to investigate what is the matter with this person. And the healer will make statements, and according to the answers of the family, he or she, and it's often a woman, will make up a picture of what this person is. So the healer might say, she vomits green something or other. And they'll say, yes, she or she something, I suppose. And then they say, she has wild dreams. Yes, yes, yes. And then, in this way, the healer builds up a picture and slaps her hand on the ground and says, it is that thing. She is Twaza. That's the Kosa word. I, don't, I can't remember what the Zulu word is. And the, everything is very excited. That means she's going to be a healer. And so all preparations are made for her. And she goes and works with a traditional healer and lives there for two or three years. And, and that's a long story about what happens there. But she has to tell her dreams and wake up the healer in the night to say so, what it is, what they are. So I went to this very wise healer who'd been through all these, these uh, necessary um, training uh, programs. She was dancing and calling out to the ancestors. And at one time she actually knelt and uh, used her toes and she had her switch. And I'd taken her a gift of white beads which I was told to do, and she'd strung these up and she had this huge thing of white beads around her. And um, I talked to her, she was very, a very introverted person. Her eyes were looking somewhere else. And I suppose the answer to the question is, that is where I actually saw the, what I would regard as a he proper healing dance being done. It's a long story, but it could be much longer. <laughs>
You invented movement with touch. How would you describe this as part of the Sesame Practitioner's toolkit? Well, I think all of Sesame's work is absolutely essential. But I think because people move, if they're able to, before they do anything else, and because if they're impaired in any way, the first thing that gets restricted is the movement. Um, and they may be so restricted that they're just sitting there and not moving. And I think if, because movement, I, I know I move my hands and body all the time, because I can express myself better if I'm using my hands. But if I've got to sit like this all the time, what is happening to me? I don't really know what's happening. So. Um, when I first started Movement with Touch was when I went into a hospital, up in this area actually, and we were introduced, I was training students uh, at some of these hospitals, which were these awful places where people had lived, probably somebody had had a child out of, without being married or something, you see, she was castigated forever and sent away to hospital, she was an evil woman, you know, there she went. So she lived all her life. What happened to the baby? God knows. Anyway, those are the people. These, the ones we were going to work with, were lying on bean bags, so you couldn't see any of their faces. And so we had to lift up the heads of the people and say, well, is this one of the people we're working with? No, right back on the bean bag, and then the next one. And so how can you work with people? You can't do myths and legends. You know, you can't do movement, but you can do movement because you can move their bodies for them. So what we used to do, and I, I've got a photograph, not a very good one, of very often we, could, we would have them lying down. These started in wheelchairs because they couldn't, you know. Eventually we had them lying down and then we could move their limbs for them. And I remember one young man in, in a different ward because the whole subject is the same, who had what's called an acute lordosis. His whole, uh, this part of his body, his chest was twisted sideways and he was always like this. This is his position. And we've got this on video that we were able to gradually to unwrap him. And he was able to do this with help. And his face, when he's doing it, if proof is needed, that he was feeling something, but here it was. So that's where really started me with movement to touch. I realized that it was invaluable to many, many people, in particular to those people. But what I 